Good morning. Conferences have become a little bit like rock shows. You know, I used to be a musician and producer uh, playing the guitar, and now I speak in front of you, but the music hasn't changed, so it's really interesting. So I'm going to show you the future a little bit now. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Sunday is a perfect day to think about the future. Wow, that was pretty long. Brett, where's Brett? Was that correct? You speak. <laughs> so, this is an app called Say Hi. Right? It's a real time translation app. I was in Japan three months ago. I was at the sushi, uh, the sushi place, and we were talking about stuff, and I spoke in German into the app, and the, the sushi chef spoke to me in Japanese. Uh, we talked for about half an hour, you know, really simple things, of course, right? Now, in the very near future, you'll wear an earpiece, and you will not be actually holding a mobile or so, and you can speak in real time in 30 languages to anybody in the world. Right? So that could be heaven. You know, you could marry a woman from Vladivostok or, you know, some whatever, right? It could be hell also, because our kids would say, yeah, you know, why do I learn languages? You know, I just, you know. I'm not sure that's a good idea, but you can see that the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed, as my friend William Gibson likes to say, science fiction author. So I'm going to share with you today some future principles. If you have received my book, Technology, Humanity, there's many other principles and rules in here, but uh, these are sort of customized for you guys. So, uh, but take a look at uh, chapter three in this book. So first of all, what do I actually do? This is my job. Yeah. I don't predict the future, I observe the future. There's a very big difference. Uh, you could predict the future 50 years ago. Alvin Toffler, Arthur C. Clarke, maybe Ray Kurzweil, you know, recently. But to predict the future today, 50 years from today, it's virtually impossible. Because right? everything that we have known in the past has, has become real. Right? Not everything, but almost everything. Right? In the next 10 years, we're going to invent stuff. You know, science is making leaps that is just unreal. Solar energy, great example. If you invested in solar energy 10, 12 years ago, like I did, you lose all your money. But today, solar energy, finally, there's been so much innovation, it is the next big thing in energy. It's going to be the end of oil. Right? It's a strange thing to think about this. Imagine what that would mean for the Middle East region. You know, no more oil to fight about. Right. But observing the future is really what I do, and I start with the first principle right here. Assume less, discover more. Right. There's so many things that we look at, at what we do because we are successful, otherwise we wouldn't be here. You know, we're looking at this and saying, oh, the future is going to be like today, maybe faster, more complex, but pretty much like today. Right. But that's not true. Right. The future is already here, it just we have to pay more attention to things. So if you look, you know, I was in the music business. I was a musician and producer. We sold records, right? Allegedly, that's how we make money, and of course, playing concerts, right? But what's happening in the music business today? We don't sell records. You know, Spotify has, for $10, 21 million songs. Music is free, basically. You make some money from Spotify, but basically, music has now become a whole different logic that's about marketing, advertising, licensing, gigs, synchronization. So we have to pay attention to the future. You should spend at least 5% of your time looking at what is not already here. And this is difficult because we're already 150% working on what is here, right? just to get things done. But you know, I work around the world. I live in Switzerland. Uh, but. Everywhere I go, I, I can observe one thing. A company that looks at the next five years as part of the plan and is ready to reinvent, they're always ahead, always doing better. The second point I want to make is you know, people are worried about the future these days. It's, it's kind of a strange thing. The last two or three years, when you talk to people about the future, there's a lot of worry. In Europe, we worry about climate change. Well, there's a little bit of that here as well. <laughs> it's a huge discussion. But the more bigger worry is this one. Robots will learn everything. They will take our job first, and then they will come and kill us. Right? Right? This is what Hollywood tells us, basically. Right? 
anything from Black Mirror to X Machina, it's always going to look bad. You know, there's terrorists, there's robots, there's, there's disasters. The, the future is not good. And nothing could be further from the truth. You know, as I like to say, the future is better than we think. I mean, it's actually amazing what technology can do for us, you know, what are the kind of accomplishments. There's huge issues about what else it does, of course, right? Like privacy and those kind of things. But primarily, it's positive, you know, reinventing of energy. Right? Cheaper, more efficient technology is pretty much everywhere. Cheaper healthcare, maybe in 20 years, solving cancer. I mean, that's all like it's not so far away. I'm going to live to see most of those things happening. We just have to do one thing. We have to govern technology wisely. That's not going to be so easy right? because technology becomes so powerful. You know, what are the most powerful companies in the world today? Not oil companies, gas companies, maybe the military or the banks in Switzerland. Right? The data companies. The digital companies are the most powerful companies in the world, and they are your future competitors. Because every business they're in, they're going just a little bit to the left or to the right or the top, and they're just moving up in the food chain like this. I mean, look at Amazon. Right? Amazon is actually starting a logistics company. I don't know if you read the news. But you know, next thing Amazon will do is like fly us to the Mar to Mars or something. I don't know, but you know, Amazon is in banking. Amazon is going to be in insurance with Berkshire Hathaway Fund. I mean, they're basically going like this. In China, this company called Alibaba, which I'm sure you know, they own 65 businesses. Alibaba is so powerful in payments now that in Switzerland, where I live, all of the restaurants have to have Alipay. Otherwise, the Chinese will not buy anything because they can't pay. Right? Or they'll buy something, but they won't pay, right? uh, using Alipay. <laughs> it's pretty funny, you know, when, when you're on top of a mountain, you know, just in nature, in Switzerland, and there's a Chinese group, and they don't speak any English, German, French, whatever, right? But they have Alipay. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But anyway, so this is the first principle. Let's not think bad about the future. No matter what you think about politics or, or environment or stuff, so, there's so many good things that we can think of. You know, we just have to take a look and find out what it is. The bottom line about technology is this. Right? Technology is morally neutral until we use it. It's always been like this. The nuclear bomb, yeah, now we're able to build power plants from the same technology. Whether that's good or bad, I'll leave that up to you. But you know, basically, technology can be used in different ways. You know? I mean, people are addicted to television. We don't make that illegal. We use the car, you know, it kills two million people a year. So the good thing about technology is that it can really change things, but we have to keep an eye on what else it does. Right? For example, the smartphone. Right? Extremely useful. I call this our external brain, yeah? our second brain. I bet many of you don't even know the phone numbers you have in here, even the close relatives you have by heart. You just keep them in here. Because you know, we've outsourced this. Right? So it's now our phone numbers, it's our banking, it's our dating so for some of us. Right? It's, it's music, it's money, it's everything in here. Imagine if this thing becomes more powerful and does all kinds of things. It could be like, like a copy of us. Right? And then if somebody gets your phone, you're in deep trouble. Right? because you are in here. So we have to keep a good eye on how we regulate technology and you know, who is responsible. And you know, I work a lot with the big tech companies, and I keep telling them that whatever they're going to invent, they will be responsible for it. It didn't used to be that way, because it wasn't really working. Right? But I mean, if Facebook is a great example. Right? Two and a half billion people. It's the biggest country in the world. And Zuckerberg is the president. I mean, the power that Facebook has, now they're going to have to be accountable, right? I mean, imagine if you, you have an organization of that size, and then you say, well, I don't care what happens. We'll make a lot of money. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like you got to think about that. So sometimes I think about this you know, in, the, in the context of Facebook, and it's quite clear from a European point of view, you know, Facebook is sort of gunning at democracy. Right? Because you know, social media is something we can easily use to manipulate, which is not bad when it's about advertising. 
So it's a big topic. I'll get back to that in a second. So the third point is this. Humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. And you know, some people are saying, well, that's, you, know, you lived in California too long. Right? It's a hyperbole. You know? But think about this for a second. 300 years ago, before that was the, you know, the printing press. And then we had the Industrial Revolution. Then we had uh, nuclear power and the internet and telephone. Those are all very big things. I mean, in this country, 92% used to work in agriculture. 92% of the people. You know how much it is today? 2.5. That happened in the last couple hundred years. But now the big thing is technology is changing us. Technology is capable of changing what, how we think. And then very soon you can have little nanobots in your bloodstream taking care of your cholesterol. That's already in the process of approval. Right? You can connect your brain to the internet, brain-computer interfaces. You can use virtual reality like Microsoft HoloLens right? or Oculus Rift, and you can become superhuman. I mean, who in this room does not want to be superhuman? I mean, as a supply chain manager, you wish you were superhuman all the time anyway, right? Because it's complex. I mean, imagine you were Tom Cruise in Minority Report. Remember that scene where he goes inside the data and just, you know, like this? Well, you can do that with HoloLens, right? I mean, it's, it's $6,000 and it's not, you know, it makes you a little bit sick. But, you know, just think two or three years, yeah, here. And then when you're wearing this thing at work, do you think it's going to be interesting when you get home? You, know, you take this off, you're going to say, wow, you guys are so boring, you know. I'm used to my super drive, you know, my virtual environment. It will be a huge challenge. So I would say that's about 90% good and 10% worrisome. Well, we have to make sure that 10% don't go to be 50, you know, so that we get so used to it that we can't live without technology. I mean, imagine this, you know, the other day I was in Tanzania in Africa with my son, who's not, who was, uh, well, it was the other day, three years ago. He was 19. And we were on the beach in Tanzania, and he's hitting his mobile phone desperately in wants to get the music to play. Uh, and it was the first time in his life where there was no internet. Right? And he was going like, my phone is broken. I'm saying, no, there is no internet here. Right? No music, no cloud, no network. If it's not on here, it won't play. And he's like, what? He couldn't imagine that there was a place without the internet. <laughs> it's mind broken. I mean, we're moving into a world that's going to be dramatically different. And the primary driver is this. Moore's law, the exponential change. And many people are arguing that Moore's law is ending because of the chips and all that. But basically what's happening is we're the takeoff point of this curve. Well, when I started in tech, you know, I was a musician and producer, and then I went into digital music. Uh, I was here right? at the beginning of the curve. It didn't matter what we were doing. It wasn't ready. Remember the paperless office, Napster? downloading music it was just, OK, it'll, it will work, but it's going to be 20 years. Yeah. So you know, we fried $22 million until we found out we couldn't do what we were doing because it wasn't ready. But today, you can safely say, now we're at the takeoff point, right? We're at the pivot point. So the numbering is really interesting, you know, 4, 8, 16, 32. If you go a little bit up the scale, five years, seven years, 30x. You go up the scale 30 times, you know where you get to? 30 times up the scale, 1 billion. So in 40 years, roughly, we can live in a world that's 1 billion times as far as today in terms of tech. That's hard to imagine. So I take this long list of things. I'll, I'll talk more about them in detail. But let's just take quantum computing. The idea of having a supercomputer a 3D computer that does not use transistors but lives in a gas cloud. IBM, Microsoft, many others. Today, that machine is about $300 million. And they are the first ones that have the same computing capacity than the human brain. 300 trillion calculations per second. Now, that machine will become the new normal, and you can go through your mobile phone to the cloud and run your DNA, your genome, in 10 seconds. That will be our reality in a very short time. So when you're on a date, 
right? You, you think you're, you want to go a little bit further later on, you, you can check your DNA to see if it's compatible. Right? 10 seconds. Today it takes a week. So linear thinking is a bad idea. You know, linear thinking means I'm expecting that next year I'm going from four to five to six to seven. You know, that's what humans do. That's what we do. Do not expect the world to be linear because it, it, it has ended. I mean, the first couple of steps, one, two, four, is like one, two, three. There's not much of a difference. <laughs> but now, and this is crucially when, if you're uh, in supply chain and, and logistics or warehousing or, or manufacturing, because we're talking about scientific progress at a huge scale. And sometimes actually so huge we can't manage because we're linear. You know? So here's a key question you should answer tonight when you have a minute. You sit by the pool, say, what will my company do in five to seven years? Because the answer will be that in most cases, revenue streams are now changing every five to seven years, 50 to 80 percent. I mean, look at Apple. 67 percent of what they sell now is iPhones. 2.4 billion sold. Didn't exist eight years ago. And this is really happening all around us. The German car companies, I work a lot with those guys, uh, they're all shifting to saying, well, we don't sell cars. We sell mobility. Because in 10 years, people like us, yeah, we may still buy a car, but you know, our kids are probably going to do a subscription to a car, a Spotify for cars. That's already happening in the US also. Or they may decide not to have a car at all and just use ride sharing. I mean, if we don't think exponentially, we're going to be left behind. So that, that is really the first key point here. Right? So for example, mobility is, makes a great example uh, from ARC Investment here on this slide. There's two key trends. We're going from gas, uh, fossil fuel powered, to electric. And we're going from human driven to autonomous. And you could say, yes, you know, that's not true everywhere. It's, it's a cultural question. I mean, the US is a car, uh, uh, a car culture. And so is Germany. But in Switzerland, where I live, we all have cars, but we don't use them. Because we have amazing public transportation, first class, too. <laughs> so it's actually much quicker. You know, there's two more things I want to add to this. Hydrogen cars, I think Toyota is heavily involved in this, uh, and assisted driving. I, I would put my money on assisted driving, not on autonomous driving. I think assisted driving will be absolutely huge because it's, it's possible, it's doable. Totally autonomous? like Waymo does in Palo Alto. You know. I mean, in Palo Alto in the suburbs, a five-year-old can drive, right? I mean, it's, it's huge streets, and there's nothing happening. And I mean, and it's <laughs> hey, yeah, OK, so I have the bot drive, you know. But take the same car to Rome or to Beirut right, or Jakarta. You're going to have an accident as soon as you get in the car. So I think that's a really interesting trend if we're looking at the future, those kind of lens. You know? This huge transformation. I mean, imagine if you're Mercedes-Benz, you're selling fancy cars to people like us for 150,000 or so a piece, and three years later, the same car is worth 50,000. And that money gets made by everyone in the food chain. Now, with a subscription to Mercedes-Benz, gone. Right? Where's, where's that margin? It's just gone. Because I'm going to pay about 1,500, 2,000 a month, and I can get any car I want. And that whole margin, the 100K, is just no longer there. So we have to think about what happens here and where it does, what it does for us. So uh, on this slide, you can see this is a, de a demo by MIT. You know, how the world would change if we actually go ahead with all these ideas like autonomous driving. This demo shows what happens in a city on an intersection that's fully automated. In a fully autonomous city, there will be traffic lines, no street signs, no stopping signs, because the machine would know everything that goes on and would just flawlessly plan it. 
Remember Blade Runner? You know, the, f the first one, the good one, not, not the latest one. But, right? <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the, electric, uh, the vehicles are just flying like this. That, that's because the computer will make the intersection so fluid that you would never stop at the intersection. It would just be like needles, you know. And if you were human in this city, you couldn't drive. I mean, there's no way a human could fit in here because a human would be the factor that makes it all break down. So this is really interesting. You know, we have to ask the question, what if? What if we can do this? That's the question that gets us to rethink and transform what we're doing. So when I was in the music business, we talked about music moving to the cloud. And now you can see that basically the only chance for the future of music is the cloud. I mean, anybody here still buys CDs? It's OK. You can out yourself. Yeah. When you, these days, you know, if you buy a CD or a DVD and you give it to your kids for Christmas, they'll call a therapist. Yeah. I mean, you're ho hopelessly outdated. <laughs> so it's $10 for 21 million songs on Spotify. Yeah. And you know how many people are subscribing to Spotify? 110 million people are paying. Remember five years ago, we used to say, well, people will never pay for that. Music is free. Right? 110 million. Netflix, same thing. I mean, you can download stuff on BitTorrent. If you like Games of Thrones, you can get that anywhere. But now it's, yeah, Netflix is good. Yeah. So really what's happening here, this is the principle of the future, gradually, then suddenly. In other words, you don't see anything for a long time because it has to get to critical mass. But when it does, boom, it just explodes. And this is why we have to get good at understanding the future. As I like to say, jokingly say, the future used to be about tomorrow, and now the future is about next week. It's basically you know, coming at mind-boggling pace. Point number four, business as usual is dead or dying. So doing things the way that we used to do them, they still work because you know, the critical mass hasn't been really reached and so on. But you, by and large, you can count on that to be exactly like the music business. I mean, if your plan today is to open a CD shop, you know, then you're in deep trouble. You know? Bookshops, right? Bookshops are still there because people love physical books. They buy six times as many e-books on Amazon, but they still buy physical books at the airport, for example. But you know, processes are changing so quickly, it's mind-boggling. I mean, it, either dead or dying. So here's some examples. You know, basically, we're all going to where music and the transportation and so has gone. So the military, banking, and so on. I mean, banking is next in that chain of, of change, right? And you know, many people have said, for example, military defense, 80% of what we're going to spend on military in 10 years is digital. I mean, mind-boggling change as to how that will go. Spotify, great example is, as I said earlier, banking. I mean, 74% of kids are saying if the digital companies like Google, Facebook, Alibaba, if they have a financial product, I go to them. That's a scary thought. And this is happening across the world. Now here in, in your turf, the top areas where businesses are driving revenue from AI, Supply chain, 42% of businesses think they can drive revenue from AI, artificial intelligence. And of course, that's a big topic on this conference, I'm sure. I'll talk more about that as well. Well, we have to think about what I call smart everything. You know, if I look on the list, because I talked to lots of different people, the least forward-looking in terms of their process having changed in the entire world is construction. Right? They're still building in the same way. And then we have things like you know, banking that's also sort of just now moving in. Uh, supply chain logistics is actually in the front of this a little bit. And that's a very good place to be because the change will be absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, look what Amazon does here. They take all the tech that's available, uh, radio frequency ID chips, near-field communications, and they build this store called Amazon Go. They're going to open 3,000 stores in the US. You just walk in with the Amazon card or your Amazon mo on the mobile, and, and you don't actually see anybody. You just take what you want and you leave. Of course, you do pay inadvertently, I suppose. 
But I mean, this is a mind-boggling shift. So I want to introduce you to seven game changes, and when you download slides later, you can look at more detail. First one is that data is absolutely everything. Data is driving business. Every business is moving into the cloud. The Internet of Things is connecting everything outside of the mobile and the computer, processes, logistics, and so on. Everything is becoming smart. I wouldn't call that intelligent, just call it smart. I'll tell you later why. <laughs> and we can compute everything. You take those five things, I'll, I'll show you two more, but you took those five things, that's already a huge shift because all of a sudden we can be more efficient, we can be faster, we can invent new things, we can predict. But when you look at this, it, would, it could be potentially scary saying, well, in that case, the, it's just a giant machine. Right? But it's not like this, because you know, machines can only measure what machines understand, which I'll tell you about shortly. But the human role is still very, very important here. Uh, the other one, that's what I call transact anything, the blockchain. That's a big topic from, from Rick, right? Rick? Richie? Richie? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Richie will talk about that tomorrow. And of course, make anything, 3D printing. I mean, in your business, you know, we talked about this, I don't know, what, 20 years? Didn't happen. Well, it kind of happened, but not in a big way. But you can expect that to be a huge shift, right? Spare parts? Now, we can print 150 composite materials. In the near future, we're going to have nanotechnology and material sciences. You could print many things on demand. Uh, no more shipping expenses, just anything on demand. It's, it's already happening with GE and airplane engines. Right? So those are the same uh, major shifts. You, you want to print that out and put it on your desk and so you understand this. Uh, blockchain, yeah, we'll talk about that tomorrow, but this is one of the things where I would say, okay, blockchain to me is completely logical for smart contracts and anything that does not involve uh, government regulation, <laughs> like money. And blockchain and money, I don't believe in, really. But contracts, yeah, logistics, shipping, information. Look at the stats here. Again, you're going to go into detail tomorrow, but you know, people like the blockchain idea because of traceability, records management, autom supply chain automation. It's a totally obvious target. And in a way, you could say blockchain is really just the next generation of software. And it's, it's not like we're going to think about Bitcoin as, as, the, uh, as the new mantra. So we'll talk about that a bit tomorrow. 3D printing. Um, I was in, in China a couple of months ago. And I went to a, a place where they're printing 3D houses, a Chinese company called Wei Sun. It's a huge company. They built this house inside and outside. So they print the furniture. Right? Maybe they'll print the people one of these days. But, but they print everything in four days. Okay? The whole thing. And it's a giant printing machine that prints the components of the house, and then they just stack it together. And you would argue it's probably pretty ugly, you know? But hey, you know, this house, I mean, four days? When I think about what that would do for office buildings, that's already uh, happening with solar energy and so on and so on. And so Wired Magazine just ran the story, this machine will change the world. That was, I think, 2002. <laughs> but it's finally happening. So don't miss that trend. I think it's very important. And we have all these things coming together, like what I call the mega shifts, the three in my book. So data, automation, smart machines. Of course, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about here. But the bottom line is this. We're going to go into this world, right? Everything connected at all times. That is just not because of efficiency, but also we can create new models. We can collaborate. Right? We can use APIs. We can figure out new business ideas. But here's the big challenge there. Right? Security, safety, and ethics. Who's allowed to see the data? What exactly do they do with it? I mean, the more connected we get, the more challenges we'll have. And if we can learn one thing from the Facebook story, is we're all very connected through Facebook or maybe LinkedIn. Right? But when somebody wants to abuse it, it's actually not so hard. So that's something we have to keep a good eye on as to what happens here and which way we're going with this. 
factory of the future? This is from CB Insights. I'm sure you're experts on this, but it seems like every process in the factory, there will be some technology that will change it. How long will that take? Well, you can say in some uh, industries it will take much longer. But mining, for example, minerals, oil, it's already happening. What's going to happen to people? I mean, in this factory, there are some people, you know, there's a, a lonely person here. Uh, but by and large, no. But you know, the, the master of automation, Amazon, they hired 175,000 people last year. So what are they doing with all the people if they automate? Well, they're doing things that become possible because of automation. And yes, you know, they're probably more highly skilled people. So this is a huge challenge for our social structure of employment. But it's not utterly hopeless. I'll talk about it in the last chapter of my talk. But in the US, you know, of course, we have huge issues with automation, like truck drivers. Yeah? 16 million people are professional drivers. And will all of them lose their job because of this? No. It's not that simple. But a significant number. And can we then use those people to deal with automation? Well, probably not, because they wouldn't know how to do it. So it's a big challenge of how we move up the value chain. And so point number five is this. We have to start thinking not just exponential, and that's very difficult for us because we're not. You know? I mean, we're not going to live faster because the internet is faster. Or, uh, you know, we have to sleep, we have to eat, we have downtime. We just can't. You know? I mean, if you ever tried to multitask as a human, you know, a 15-year-old kid doing gaming and doing homework, maybe. Yeah? But by and large, multitasking means your performance goes like this. Right? It's not going to happen. So we have to think about this as a, a mental set. You know, we have to think about, OK, not just uh, exponential, but also what I call combinatorial. We have to look at all those data points of technology and combine them into new ideas. That's what all successful companies do. I mean, Mercedes-Benz, as an example, again, 10 years ago, 55-year-old you know, German engineers would sit around the table, talk about how to make a better car that uses less gas and just improve the process. You know, today, they're sitting around the room. They're talking about the Internet of Things, intelligent machines, cognitive computing, quantum computing, the cloud. And you know, it's like, how are they supposed to know all these things? But this is what we have to do, exponential and combinatorial. So that means your, your mindset in this business in particular is going from the narrow focus on execution, infrastructure, technology, to a, a broader focus. It's very important because only with a broad focus will you have a future. So um, give you some examples from the car industry. Many people are saying that we're going to switch to essentially driverless vehicles. Of course, you realize this is primarily a cultural question, not a technical question. Uh, in Norway, we already have 36% of all cars are electric. And they have lots of oil. You know, so that they're not doing it for environmental reasons. They're doing it for, you know, for other reasons of, uh, well, that's probably part of the story. But, so that's kind of a story here. I mean, if you look at this, basically autonomous cars will search. It's quite clear. I think you know, if you replace autonomous with assisted, it's probably more logical. Uh, uh, electric vehicle sales. And here is an interesting one, right? the end of the combustion engine. And I think we see this coming. Toyota announced it, I think, and Volvo announced it, I think, 10 years or 12 years, respectively, no more combustion engines. I mean, if you live in southern Germany, for example, around Stuttgart or so, where all the big car companies are, you make clutch parts, transmission parts, engine parts, and a regular car is about 2,000 moving parts in a transmission, in a clutch. Electric car is 24. You're in deep trouble right? <laughs> if you don't see that coming. Because the electric car does not have a clutch. It has software. It has a few other moving pieces. I saw a demo in Japan the other day where a bunch of cars were driving to the repair station. It was fully automated. There's one person 
operating the repair station. You drive in, the bots come out, they mess around under, underneath the car, the software gets hooked up, software update, a couple of things, boom, done, out. When we talk about supply chain, this is a whole, you're going to supply the robots, not the car. I mean, mind-boggling the change that we see here, and also, of course, the maintenance. Huh? I mean, is anybody in their right mind going to buy a, a regular uh, gas engine car in 10 years? When I mean, look at the numbers. Huh? The car will go 2,000 kilometers, or miles even, and, and the maintenance will be a fraction. But of course, it's not the same fun driving and all that stuff, right? But you're not going to get an electric Hummer, or may maybe there will be one. I don't know. But cheaper by the mile, that's quite clear. Mercedes-Benz again, they're rethinking what a van looks like. It's very clever. You know, they're thinking of the van. They're still a driver, but otherwise it's a giant machine. It has, it has an automatic feeder robot. It has drones. It has, of course, electric drive battery system. It's completely like a, like a space station. Right? And the business model of Mercedes-Benz is not to sell the van, but to get a piece of each transaction that the company with the van undertakes. And we're talking about serious thinking here, right? So that's basically that some examples of what happens. And the same in the medical business. You may have seen two weeks ago the presentation of the Apple Watch. With one, one big stroke, Apple is entering the medical industry. So it's quite clear where this is going. This is no longer a watch, which, by the way, outsells all of the Swiss watches easily, all of them combined. Right? Now it's a medical device. And you know what the next step is? We're going to have something like the iPhone for remote diagnostics. So you'll buy a box for $100. You can prick your finger. You can cough into it. You wear the watch. 80% of doctor's visits are needed. And we will trust Apple with our data. Right? Well, maybe I will. You know? But I mean, Apple is the only company that does not mess with our data, really. Right? I mean, compared to the other online companies. At least that's what they're saying. You know? <laughs> Let's see how it shakes out. Right? But this is what's happening in the, in the medical field. We're going to read our data. And we're going to put that data on the cloud. And then we're going to be able to make healthcare much more affordable. And we don't need as many doctors to do expensive things. You know, 88% of all doctor visits are essentially unneeded. They could be done in other ways. So mind-boggling shift. Again, new power, new responsibility, because whoever has that data is in deep trouble if it goes out. Now, talking about supply chain, if you translate this to supply chain, you get to similar results because the next thing we're going to do is going to speak to machines. We already are speaking to machines. Amazon Echo, people have Echo, Alexa here, yeah, some of you. Yeah, Google Home, Siri. So today, when you speak to Amazon Echo or Alexa, you have to speak a little bit like, you know, like speaking, you know, very slowly to a child or, or you know, and it will get it. There's lots of funny videos on YouTube about how it's not getting it, right? But it's quite clear in two years, you know, we're going to be at 99.98% or so of language recognition, natural language processing. So as a supply chain manager, you're going to speak to the machine, and you're going to give the machine complex demands, because the machine will be so intelligent, it can actually understand what you're trying to say. UPS, UPS are already using this, right? UPS is using AI to figure out how they can drop off the next parcel while people are still on the road to their house. And they're speaking with machines. So here's an example. Google has a new technology called Duplex. And what they have done is essentially said, OK, if machines can understand languages, then they can also speak. Right? Listening, speaking, hearing, sort of the same pot. Right? So now this machine co makes calls on your behalf. It can actually simulate your voice. That's currently not in the box, but it can actually call people and sound like a human. They showed this about three months ago. It's created a huge amount of discussion about being deceived or so, but check it out. Hey, Google. 
Book a table for two at El Cocotero on Tuesday at 7. All right. Just in case that's not available, can I try between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m.? Sure. All right. I'll call to book under your name and phone number, and I'll update you in the next 15 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect. Thanks. El Cocotero, how may I help you? Hi, I'm the Google Assistant, calling to make a reservation for a client. Um, this automated call will be recorded. Can I book a table for Tuesday the 12th? Okay, cool. And how big is the party? It's for two people. This is a machine talking, okay? Now imagine if you call your favorite restaurant with a bot. Right? I mean, in, in Europe, where I live, if we call the restaurant with a bot, you know, you'd hang up about after about a half a second, you would hang up, right? But if the bot doesn't say it's a bot, then we would stay on, but then it would be really deceiving. Right? I mean, imagine the kind of abuse you can get here. Right? You want to get divorced, you tell the bot to call your wife, right? or your husband. Or, I mean, it's, it can be used in many different ways. But the new interface is no interface. We just speak. So I, I, I was in Los Angeles uh, uh, half a year ago on the future of television, and we were all sitting on the couch looking at this giant screen, and there's like 25 of us from different places between 12 and 85, and we're testing a voice-controlled TV system. You sit on the couch, and you can say whatever you want in 30 languages, and the machine will pull, pull up the program and play it for you. So you can say, Kojak, 1984, second episode, minute 24, boom, it will play. That's the future of Netflix. Now think about your business. If you can sit down in your chair and you can say, show me the route of this driver, compare it with the other driver, look at the average number of visits, look at the amount of gas being spent, and we'll show it all in a graph just like this. That's a few years away. That's already kind of there with IBM Watson. You know, it's a little bit overpromised, but that leads me to point number six. Future principle number six. Data is the new oil and AI is the new electricity. That's pretty much all you need to know about the future right there. Right? I mean, whoever has the most data and the biggest computer and the most intelligence wins. That's the first part. The second part is, on top of that, you have to have a brand and trust and relationships. So I'll talk about that in a little while. But this is where it all starts. If you don't use data, you don't have intelligence, you can't do things, you lose. And this is all backed by this simple change in computing. Computers are no longer programmed. Well, they still are, but we're on the way of transitioning this, right? So computers are now machines that can learn things, right? called machine learning, deep learning, right? neural networks. You heard about those words before. It's a little bit hard to explain without spending the next two hours on this, but, but uh, basically machines, as uh, Demis says, the CEO of DeepMind, Computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge. Now, this is where we should start thinking, okay? If you've been in this business for 20 or 30 years, you have knowledge, experience, understanding. Shop for knowledge, as some people say, right? Will the computer have that sort of knowledge? It'd be very difficult because that knowledge wasn't engineered, you know, it wasn't download it. It was learned by us. I mean, it's an interesting angle when we look at knowledge. You would think of ourselves as being knowledgeable. What kind of knowledge does a machine have? So if you feed IBM Watson books, it will read, uh, I think the latest number is 1.2 million pages per minute. Okay. So if you're into philosophy, you feed IBM Watson all the books about philosophy. It takes them two minutes to read the whole thing. Does it make the machine a philosopher? Well, the answer is pretty clear. It does not. It makes them understand all the words in the book, and cross references and look up and all, you know, it's, it's just data and information. But data information is not what we do. If you're a philosopher, you would understand the difference. You may not actually have read all the books, but you can put stuff together. You understand the context. That's called understanding. So I don't think we should worry too much about machines having some knowledge, uh, at least not for the next 20 years. Uh, 50 years, 100 years, yeah. 
I will be with Elon Musk, you know. But when you think about artificial intelligence, you're looking at things like uh, Ex Machina. We are very far away from this. So we shouldn't worry about that too much, except for that we should not allow companies to build this and have it ready to roll out in 30 years. Uh, uh, that's a different discussion. But this is really what is reality today, and that's your reality. The future of AI is not AI, it's IA, right? intelligent assistance. And look what companies are doing with artificial intelligence, image recognition, trading, scalable processing, predictive maintenance, you know, software. And this is why I recommend that you invest in IA, you know, intelligent assistance. Not so much in the idea of replacing humans. Machine learning has been used as a good example. Now machines are able to actually learn, understand context, but not learn like us. I mean, you can watch 100 hours of video uh, about India, for example, on YouTube. Okay? Many people study on YouTube. But then when you go to Mumbai, into the bazaar in Mumbai, it takes you four seconds. You've learned more than 100 hours of information on YouTube. And why is that? Well, because you're in the middle. You're perceiving information like this when you're in the bazaar, not like this when you're on YouTube. That's what machines do. Uh, in fact, machines are looking at 100 trillions of movies on YouTube <laughs> to try to figure out what to do. You heard about DeepMind three years ago. The most uh, complicated game in the world, the Chinese game called Go. And it was said that the computer would take 15 years to figure out how to win in, in the game. 3.5 trillion possible moves. It's not mathematical, it's strategic. And Google's machine, DeepMind, won the game after 14 months of practice. Not by being programmed, but by observing games and finding its own way by learning. Right? Imagine what this machine could do for supply chain. Right now, that's not possible because we don't have the data to give to the machine. <laughs> you know, it's not all connected. But I mean, this is coming, right? Let's call this machine deep supply. Okay? And we could use that to really, you know, turbo start and catalyze what we're doing. This chart from PwC shows what's happening, the potential impact of AI quite clearly. You can see here on the, on the right, transportation, logistics, all of this is basically in the top row of change. Right? But think about this, especially when they mean AI, they really mean IA, you know, intelligent assistance rather than thinking machines. And here you can see on these charts, and we'll distribute them again later, you know, this is basically what's happening. I'm sure you're aware of this, lots of discussions at this event. But basically looking at you know, supply chain is on top of the range there in terms of innovation with AI. Oop, sorry. Uh, and here you can see that also on the top of the range. It's basically quite clear that you know, the benefit of that is tangible, and it's certainly an action item for you. So, Basically, what's happening is that machines are going to go inside of our heads, our operations. They're going to figure out what we're doing. They're going to draw co conclusions. They're going to find patterns. Right? Will they ever find what we have in ourselves, you know, consciousness? That's doubtful. They can only find the obvious things. Most of what we do isn't obvious. You know, Marvin Minsky, the creator of artificial intelligence, of the word, right? He said, <clears throat> there's, there's many things that we do that we don't know that we do, and we do them the best. In other words, if you have shop floor knowledge, most of it you can't talk about because you don't know that you have it. It'd be very hard for a machine to understand this. But nevertheless, you know, we're at the, uh, at the cusp of what people now call the fifth industrial revolution. I mean, we've barely learned to understand the fourth industrial revolution. Right? But now the fifth one is uh, cyber uh, physical systems and then artificial intelligence on top. And this is something you have to understand because your turf is the primary turf you know, for that innovation. Also manufacturing, logistics, shipping. Uh, Ladies Rachel said roughly we could save about 56% of all expenses of logistics if everything was connected and AI would run the logic. So very important to understand where this is going. Point number seven. 
humanity on top of technology, not underneath technology. There's many things that make a company valuable, and it definitely isn't just the tech. I mean, think about this for a second. An inefficient company is a nuisance. You'd probably get rid of the services of that company. But do you love a company because they're efficient? Yeah, that's just one data point. It's kind of like asking, do you love your husband or your wife because they're efficient? I mean, if your husband or your wife is inefficient, that is a, that is a problem, right? But the reverse isn't true. Efficiency doesn't figure very high there. It's just one of the things that you like. So having a brand, figuring out what to do as a human, what you do, what you don't do, right? those are very important things. You know, if you look at me like this, and you say, oh, GERD is a great uh, source of data, right? then I have become a bot. I mean, you can go to Google Trends and get data. Right? Uh, and in the near future, you can ask IBM Watson, and, and we'll just give you a speech. In fact, I think there will be a TED Talk uh, scheduled next year where all the speakers will be robots. They are already very robotic. You know, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I don't do that many TED Talks anymore. But, but now you've got to think about this. right? So here's Jeff Bezos. Right? Jeff says, on one hand, when it comes to really important decisions, data trumps intuition. He keeps saying this. We've heard this many times. Right? Now, last week, he said this. His best decisions were based on intuition, not analysis. Now, which one of the two is true? Well, the bottom line is this, you know, for us, commerce is driven by data. Meaning is driven by humans. Don't confuse the two. This is exactly what Jeff is doing. If he decides to do the Kindle, that is not going to be driven by data because the data doesn't exist. You know, how can you go to a customer and say, uh, I'm going to have a thing called the Kindle. Would you tell me if you would buy it? Yeah, good luck with that. You know, Steve Jobs didn't think about that when he made the iPad. And Elon Musk, no matter what you think of him, you know, didn't think about that. He didn't ask his people, uh, people in the audience and say, hey, would you like a cool car that does the X, Y, Z, right? I mean, it's basically just intuition. So very important. We use data, but really we decide because we're human. We decide based on relationships, experiences, trust, brand, and in 10 years, when the whole world is completely automated and connected, that will be the most important factor. The CEO of Walmart said the other day that in the future that's ultimately connected is the humanness that will set us apart. This is the CEO of Walmart, okay? The tall order. Let's see what he will do. I think Doug, that's his name. So in this world, we have binary information. And you're dealing with that every single day. But binary means yes, no, yes, no, zero, one, zero, one. Right? Are you binary? I mean, are you going to the back of your head, retrieving a JPEG and saying, yes, it's good, right? That's not what we do. Uh, in fact, humans are what's called multinary. We have 0 0.15, 2.87, and you know, two seconds later, it's completely different. We're actually not a machine. It's hard to believe, right? But even though, of course, in Silicon Valley, they would argue this and say that we are machines, right? But what we do as humans, purpose, relationships, passion, imagination, it's impossible for a machine. Well, maybe not impossible, maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years. I hope not. Well, it's, imp it's important that we set those two things apart. We still need to actually keep the humans in the loop. No matter how much we automate, the humans should be in the loop and should also be in charge, in my view. Will that be possible in 20 years when the machines are smart? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, clearly, this is our challenge. Right? Technology is exponential. Humans are not. Now, don't cry when you see this, OK? Because it will not help you to become exponential. <laughs> you know, if you want to become exponential, you become a machine. Yeah. And that would not be a good idea. Because when you become a machine, you also become 
a commodity. Everything that is a machine and technology, when it's really ingrained and really there, it's cheap and it's easily substituted. So very important that we think of what we can, yeah? imagination, observation, foresight, intuition, ethics, meaning. That's why people work with you. So I think it would be impossible to say that the future without technology will even exist. It does not. Right? And we're not going to go back on technology and, and say we won't have AI or, you know, that's not going to happen. But at the same time, this is what we have. Yeah. Don't try to be exponential except for your thinking. You know, thinking, yes, but living. Uh, machines don't do relationships. Remember, this is the only thing that counts in business. Trust, relationships, experiences, understanding. The rest is just all extra stuff. However, I would say that if you have relationships with people, but then your business is really performing very badly, <laughs> that's going to, because of tech, right, that's going to end the relationship as well. So there is a, a good sort of interface between those two things. So. so a final challenge, and then we'll take some questions, and we can have a bit of discussion. Right? This is really what's happening in technology. Technology has no ethics, huh? and it shouldn't. I mean, would you expect the machine to worry about the quality of life or values or love or whatever you want? I mean, the machine doesn't care. It's a zero and a one machine, and it's gigantic. I mean, even a supercomputer would not have the understanding of all the components of life that we have. And it's very important to understand we are inventing machines that can fundamentally change who we are. Thinking machines, genetic engineering, geoengineering. So for that to end well, you know, we're going to have to inject some interesting ethics, you know, from thinking about what we actually want from this. I mean, the internet companies are the best example. Right? Google, Amazon, Facebook, they have become so good that we think of them as a threat. <laughs> it's, it's a total paradox, right? They're, in fact, so powerful and, and so fast-moving, and they invent everything. I mean, Google has 160 products. Now we're looking at Google and saying, oh, this guy's, you know, I love what you guys are doing, but God, you know, you're like you know, running the world. Right? So Google is now going to be a leader in digital ethics right? in making sure that we get the right thing, that our rights are being respected. Right? Because this is also what's happening. Our co-workers are going to be machines because of technology. No, probably not actual machines, even though some of those also. But, you know, in the cloud. I mean, intelligent digital assistants IDAs, they're going to be everywhere. So you can, you can speak to a wristwatch and say, hey, I have to go to Pittsburgh, figure it out. Well, you can already do that. It's just cumbersome, you know. <laughs> but this is what's happening in the cloud. It's extremely powerful. Look at this number of robots, you know. This is a chart showing the, the skews of robots. And basically, robots are becoming completely normal now. I mean, Baxter, the most popular robot, it costs now, what, $14,500. Uh, the kind of Baxter 10 years ago was about $2 million. And so these robots will be absolutely changing our lives, which leads me to the point number eight. Right? Useless humans. I hear this everywhere I speak. People are saying, oh, yeah, pff, robots, AI, thinking machines. Right? We become useless. Right? Now, do you believe that? Why do we become useless if we have a better machine? I don't understand. Right? That's like saying the carpenter is useless because now he has an electric hammer rather than a regular hammer. Right? I don't think we're going to be useless. I think what's happening is this, that the machines will do all the routines. It's the end of routine. The machines will figure out how to do the bookkeeping, how to do the financial advice, how to run the truck, how to fly an airplane, you know, how to make a burger. Yeah. But what happens when the routine is taken care of by machines? Then we can do other things, right? We can do things on top of the routine. If you are a lawyer and the machine does the non-disclosure agreement and checks on the facts of the contract, what can you do with the rest of your time? Well, you can do some creative work with that contract, and you can figure out how to 
offer better solutions. If you're a doctor that has IBM Watson, IBM Watson can tell you about 500,000 other cases of cancer as you're going down the hall. Right? Makes you a super doctor. Yeah, you can be lazy maybe, because you're giving up your own thinking. So the end of routine is not the end of work. It's just the end of routine. If your job is 100% routine, you're in deep trouble, because that will end. But think about this for a second. Which job is 100% routine? Okay. A pilot? Yeah, you could argue, yeah, OK. The plane can fly itself. It can. But there's many other reasons why we have a pilot. Last not least, because you wouldn't go on a plane that was a machine, right? So a pilot is going to stay, even if the plane can fly. If you're cashier at the supermarket for checkout, that job is toast. Right? End, of, end of discussion. That's 30 million jobs. It's huge. Right? Call center? Right? I mean, if it's uh, trivial transactions like changing your flight, call center will be fully automated. I mean, I've seen demos that you would not believe. <laughs> That's 20 million people out there. I mean, if, if the New York City airport closes because of snow, then today you spend all day on the phone trying to get somebody to pay attention, if, especially if it's United. Uh, and, and then, you know, in the future, you can just speak to your wristwatch and we'll say, you know, I'm ready to rebook. Boom, you're done. I mean, do you need compassion for that? Probably not. So those jobs will be gone, and we have to figure out what to do with those people. That is a social challenge, huh? a political challenge, what we do with those. Yeah. We shouldn't minimize that at all. But the potential of new work, yeah. research shows that 70% of all new jobs in 2030 have not even been invented yet. That's our kids. They're going to invent their own jobs. Do you know how many social media managers exist in the world? 32 million people who deal with social media and social content. That job didn't exist 10 years ago. Now we have 32 million. And many kids are doing that job from some island in Thailand. That's the other thing. 50% of all new jobs will not be jobs. They'll be occupations, you know, on-demand work, the gig economy. So that is a huge shift in our future where we're going with this because one thing that's very important, I think, for us to realize, especially if you have kids, anything that the machine can't do explodes in value. Uh, you could argue a machine can have imagination or be creative, yeah, but, you know, it is still the machine. <laughs> I mean, it's, it has its limits there. You know, the machine can fake empathy or simulate mystery. Uh, yeah, it can do that. But that's, as we know, not the same thing. So this is really what our kids have to learn, right? So when we talk about the future of what we do, we have to say, well, understanding tech and stuff, that's good, but really this is what we are. That's going to be our future in terms of work. I mean, you can see here on the list what people are looking to do with artificial intelligence, right? This is a question from the World Economic Forum. Say, what do you intend to do when you use artificial intelligence? And the first one is that companies, that's not exactly the right zoom here, but uh, companies want to modify the value chain. Right? They don't we'll just want to fire people. That is the second, right? <laughs> Reduce workforce due to automation. And this is a very bad idea. Every company wants to reduce the workforce because it's expensive. You know, humans are expensive, machines are cheap. But humans can do things that machines will never do, which is to increase the value of what we're doing by creating things. I mean, look at the list here, right? So that is going to be a bit of a challenge there. So this is the question we have to ask. What should or should not be automated? That is going to be your key question in the future. You have to automate because the pressure is there to be more efficient, to be faster. Clearly, that's a major driver. And then we have to say, OK, what should we not automate? Relationships. Trust, engagement, negotiation, emotional intelligence. 
So in Switzerland, I work with a, a, a big chain of grocery stores, and they have decided to remove all the cashiers and have people do the self-checkout you know, with the mobile. But they're going to take those people, and they're going to start a new department in the store that's about giving culinary advice and health advice on food. And they're going to retrain all the cashiers to go back there and tell people about what to cook and how to cook. And they're going to fire maybe 5% of the others. And will that be successful? Absolutely. It's already working. People come to the store because it's efficient and fast, and if they want a tip on cooking, they just go back there. So that is a huge shift. We should think about what should you not automate. I mean, uh, don't think too much about this automation craziness. You're not, not everything is about efficiency. Efficiency is for the CFO. Right? And I sometimes I say efficiency is for robots because it's, you know, it's a mechanical process. Yeah. But we have to think a little bit further. So let me wrap up, and then we'll take some questions. How to do the future. First, this is the principle of the future that goes you know, uncounted because I only had eight. I could only use eight. The future is not an extension of the present. You know, Technology is changing our world at a mind-boggling pace. If you think that your business in five years will be just like today, just faster, you're seriously wrong. I mean, there isn't a single business that has stayed the same because of technology. <laughs> Look at media, publishing, music, cars, transportation, cloud computing, medical. I mean, 10 years, we're not going to take pills to fix our cholesterol. We have technology for that. So I mean, it's basically the future is not like the present. So here's what you have to do if you want to be in the future. You have to continue operating the present, because that's where everything is happening. And then you have to think about the second version of the present, which is the future, at the same time. It's called hybrid thinking. So the key question you have to answer, what will my company do in five to seven years? And what skills do we need? And what do we have to cultivate for this? Because you know, innovation is not the same as transformation. Innovation we do every day, and things get better and run better. But we have to transform. The second thing is for the future uh, in terms of the action items. Yeah. We should reduce the fear of tech. But we should not be stupid. Reducing the fear means don't pay too much attention about black, to Black Mirror and X Machina and Transcendence, right? Because you know, that's Hollywood, and, and their primary goal is entertainment and based on fear. You know. We cannot go into the future based on fear. I mean, if you have kids, you have to teach them that. Right? We are creating the future. There's some things that we have to do, like we have to probably ban artificial general intelligence as a weapon. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, we have to embrace this and figure out what the next steps are. So in a nutshell, this is the formula for the future. We're going to see all this technology I mentioned earlier, the Internet of Things, the cloud, quantum computing. And on top of that, we have this. Right? We have the things that only we can do. And if you want to make money in the future, that's your position. right? You cannot be without technology because you will become uncompetitive. But if you own a technology, you become AT&T. Right? You become a mobile company, a, a, a basically a commodity. So it's very important. I think business is always about relationships, has always been, and will also be in the future. But we have to get smarter on doing this. Right? what I call the algorithms in the book. So the future is awesome humans on top of amazing technology. Again, if you have kids, think about this. The primary thing you want to, your kids to be is to be an awesome human. Technology they can always buy. Right? And they can always learn technology. But to be an awesome human requires a little bit more than just throwing a switch. As I sometimes say, happy, happiness is not a download. It's not something we can just install. So this is very important when we think about the future as to our position here. So I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, you have received the book already. Uh, good luck reading it. And it's, it's a good airplane read, you know, three hours in the future. Uh, we're going to distribute the slides. I know there were quite a few. I have a pretty active YouTube channel. 